All right. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I'm Manasi Joshi. A very good morning to all of you. Um, I want to talk about GTAG. Uh, 2016 is a very special year. As Matt pointed out, we are celebrating 10th anniversary of GTAG conference. So a very happy birthday to all of GTAG organizers. Um, 10 years ago, when we first started this conference uh, in 2006, uh, it was in London office, as Matt mentioned. And at that time, the main motivation behind this conference was, hey, back then, there was no technical conference that focused on software testing. Um, test organization at Google, especially the European regions of Google offices, was really new. Uh, so both in London and Zurich offices, we had just started hiring software engineers um, to kind of focus on software testing and verification. And we just wanted to establish a dialogue uh, with community outside of Google um, that was also focused on those interesting areas. Um, so that was the main motivation to kind of share ideas and learn from each other and really provide first ever technical platform for Google's testing, like sort of for, for test auto automation conference, right? Um, and since then, um, it was kind of, I think, attended by about 20 to 30 different attendees. And look at us now. Like, there is 10 times more attendees here in this room and some overflow rooms as well um, in, in person. And this event is being live streamed. So we know that there are even more number of people looking at all, all the speeches that are going to happen and learn from it. Um, there has been a phenomenal growth in terms of um, the kinds of areas that we are exploring uh, in the last 10 years. So I believe in like 10 years ago that some of the topics that they covered in the conference were related to things like, hey, how, how do we really do software testing in any business? And how do we really use open source tools that are out there for doing performance testing? Um, the web driver, the Selenium were kind of new and shiny things back then. And now we are looking at like like a, a wide array of topics in this conference. So I really hope that you will make full use of today and tomorrow to kind of benefit from all the topics that are being discussed here. Just to give you a few examples of things that will be talked about today and tomorrow, we are going to deal with like, um, like big challenges in finding bugs in C++ code using advanced techniques like fuzzing. We are also going to sort of talk about uh, how to use machine learning to set up your mobile test environment, how to use statistics to really figure out what tests are important for your project, what tests can be skipped. We are going to talk about like in a big setup of continuous integrations and um, kind of continuously running environments, how to deal with flaky tests. Because guess what? We all have to deal with flaky tests at some point. Um, so there is going to be just a wide variety of very interesting topics. And um, again, I encourage you guys to kind of uh, stick through and like sort of um, take advantage of uh, all those topics. I also want to make sure that I mention this, that for the very first time, uh, 2016 marks as a special year for me personally, because the organizers of this conference have awarded 14 very special and deserving candidates diversity scholarships. So I want to extend my heartiest congratulations to all the scholarship award winners. Um, and with that, I want to give a big shout out to all the 2016 GTAC organizers, all the presenters in this conference, and all of you as attendees as well. So let's give a big round of applause <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> All right, so now, um, again, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm Manasi Joshi, and I'm going to talk to you about um, evolution of business and engineering productivity function at Google through my experience at Google, of course. Um, and what I present today may or may not be directly relevant to all the areas that you guys are working with, right? But I really hope, and I sincerely hope that you kind of walk away from this speech or this conference in general and learn at least a little bit that you can apply to your work. Um, if nothing else, just sit back, relax, and uh, let me share my experience with you all. So um, to, before I go into the topic of today's uh, discussion, let me kind of give you a little bit of background about myself. I joined Google in 2005. Back then, the idea behind hiring software engineers not to do feature development, but actually develop tools and infrastructure that focused on software testing and verification was really new to Google and brand new to me. 
Um, Google is my first job right out of grad school. Um, I remember in 2004, I was visiting my fiance, now my husband, in California, and a dear friend of mine invited me over for lunch. We take food very seriously in Google, by the way. So I kind of gladly accepted his invitation and came over in campus at uh, the Mountain View campus of Google. And what I saw there was just amazing. I mean, beyond the delicious food that they served, there were so many fun things happening. There was a volleyball court and a swimming pool and a whole lot of like real awesome things that I kind of started thinking, seriously, like, can people work here when there is so much of distraction? But I want to be part of this, right? Now, before, before my visit to Google campus, my idea about working in an office, in industry, was really, really different. As a small girl, I remember going with my dad into the, their factory setting where they made boilers. My dad is a mechanical engineer. And what I saw there was like there was a lot of hot air and steam and people in good clothes, clean clothes, but with dirty hands because they were actually working inside the boiler and around it, right? And I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. Um, later on, my other experience working in an industry setting was through my internship um, working at a medical devices company for about like few four or five months. And even then, my office was like full of interns like me. Uh, without any windows, and people with really serious look on their face. And I said, okay, this is what it means like working. <laughs> uh, but then compared to all of that, what I saw at Google was like just phenomenally different. And I immediately applied for the job. Thank God I got it. And here I am almost 12 years after I came here, and still very excited and happy to come into work every single day and trying to explore new ways of testing software um, and making my team grow and scale. And really, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my team before I kind of um, explain what I do. So I joined Google um, in 2005 in a team that was kind of developing products for users, and users were internal Googlers. It was not an out, uh, outward-facing product. In 2007, I joined Google's ads business. And since then, I'm part of this ads business. Internally, we call it display ads organization. Externally, this is also known as AdSense. So just to simply define what AdSense is, um, when you serve the internet and you see the ads on the internet where it says ads by Google, that's called the AdSense business, where Google is responsible for literally funding the internet by showing those ads on different publisher websites. And internally, in Display Ads organization, with, of which I am part of, um, we kind of are responsible for showing the right ad to the right user at the right time. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to give you like information and anecdotal kind of evidence based on my experience, generally at Google, but more importantly, from the ads world. So here we go. Um, Basically, any business that grows has, and definitely this is applicable to Google, has multiple dimensions of growth. Now, what all are these dimensions? It, if your business is, um, relates to users, then you can have tremendous amount of users that grow. Your revenue model changes. The complexity added to your business changes over time, too. And all of these changes can happen in an exponential fashion for which you are not really prepared at any given time. So there is a lot of like axes of uh, growth, as I've mentioned here. I want to draw an analogy with like a model of how a small town grows into a bigger city and how that grows into a future city. In a small town setting of your business, where you have few houses and some roads that connect the houses together, um, you have sort of a very minimal amount of sharing of information happening, especially if the houses are far apart, right? Like you really have to make a lot of effort to go from one place to the other. There might be other modes of like simple buses or other transportation uh, options out there, but there is not a lot that's going on. For people to grow in such a town sort of uh, business model, the kind of infrastructure that's available is just not scalable. And that's where when people want to grow and sort of uh, start exploring and venturing into new kinds of businesses, business models, you have to also uh, like have the evolution of that small town into a big city. In a big city setting, you have ton more businesses, you have lots of construction going on, you have um, sort of 
trains and airplanes and ships and beyond roads. And all of this basically amounts to the complexity that comes into picture. But it also amounts to various ways by which people can share data with each other, right? And then you kind of realize that, hey, but in order to share that data, I still am stuck with the device on which I'm producing that data, for example. And that needs to change. Wherever I go, my data should just follow me. In other words, my data should be universally available and accessible to me without any issues of connectivity. And that's where you kind of start thinking about, yes, I need to be in a world where everything is connected and all the data is just available at my fingertips wherever I go without any issues. And by the way, in the future city model, when everybody's producing tons of information, it's not just important that we process and consume that information, but we need to use advanced techniques like machine learning or other kind of algorithms to derive even more concepts from that data that everybody is producing. And then from the information that we derive, we need to take informed decisions in order to kind of venture into new possibilities and tackle like new challenges. So that's kind of the model I'm going to like sort of follow throughout my slides moving forward. So what was it in Google in 2005, 2007, around the time when I joined? Especially in the ads world, again, my, my world of ads, the main things that we focused on um, as a brand was test engineering. Externally, we were known as Google's test engineering or Google's quality assurance. At least that's what we hired for. And internally, we kind of just said like, OK, what we'll focus on is unit tests and maybe a little bit of system tests here and there. But really speaking, we just wanted to be very sure that all the features getting built into our ad stack was, were like really fine and correct. And that, that was the complete scope of our testing. There were about 50 or so engineers focused on testing and about 500 or so engineers focused on feature development. And um, most of those changes that were happening were around front end. So a lot of our testing in the world of ads at least was really, really manual. And whatever was automated was in the form of unit tests and a little bit of system testing. Uh, at the same time, Google was also getting into business of acquiring a lot of like, talented ads businesses and growing quite a lot. We were really feature hungry. We wanted to develop more, more and more features on a daily basis. All the feature developers were. And we knew that this model of like, few tests and a lot of manual testing was not going to scale. We had to introduce automation, and we started evolving our systems in order to kind of include that automation. Now, this is a cliche slide of test pyramid. Um, some of you may think that way, and yet I have added it to my deck. There is a reason behind that. The main reason is maybe most of you already know of a test pyramid. Um, by the way, for those who do not know, there will be some of you, like me, like uh, how I was, right? Like, 11 years ago, I didn't know what this meant. Um, and there may, may be some, maybe some of you who are new to the industry, who are attending like sort of test conference for the first time, I just wanted us to be all well aligned and kind of have common language and understanding moving forward. So I've added this slide, which kind of says, what should be a typical model of test engagement for a business? And this, again, with a caveat, this may not be the best model for your business. But on an average, this generally works. What this test pyramid says is that there should be maximum investment done. And in terms of sheer numbers, there should be lots and lots of unit tests available for your stack. If you think of like your stack divided into different components, then unit tests are nothing but correctness testing of the individual functions that you define inside your component to make sure that that function is behaving. At the higher level than unit tests, you have the component uh, level tests where your components are exposing some sort of interface for external components to talk to each other, right? And that interface is essentially just a contract that says that, hey, this is my request interface, this is my response interface, and <clears throat> you want to test the component at that, that level, which will take care of executing correct number of functions depending on what the control flow is taken, and that becomes your component level tests, or in other words, regression tests to kind of like figure out that, hey, with new features added to the component, new functions getting added, we are not breaking existing functionality at all. 
And one level higher than that is the integration, where you can imagine a system where there is not a single component that's, uh, that's out there. Uh, there are multiple components that need to now talk to each other in order to achieve the greater good right? that your product is responsible for. Depending on how complicated your production setup is, your integration test can be extremely challenging and resource intensive. To give you some idea and quote, not direct numbers, but give you some idea from my ads world again, um, we have an integration test in display ads organization that has grown just phenomenally in the last few years that has been around. It, it, today it runs thousands of tests, which is more than 158% of number of tests that it ran just two years ago. It uses hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, which talks about the footprint that this particular test infrastructure has, which is more than 158% of the RAM that it used like two years ago. This test is used by thousands of developers um, who are 30-day active users for this test. This test is also invoked on every single change um, that gets submitted um, into our repository for all relevant code paths, which amounts to about thousands of sort of what we call as pre-submit runs. Pre-submit meaning before you check in your change into the versioning system, you want to make sure that that change works. So that's kind of the pre-submit model that we have. And this test, get, test gets invoked um, through like thousands of such runs. So it's a very fundamental, very, very critical test. And that literally reflects how complicated our production system has begun, uh, become with hundreds of binaries that we test um, as part of this test. But above all of this, what I really have um, highlighted here is the top portion. And the top portion is interesting because not many people think of it as important or relevant, again, I have mentioned this, there might be a caveat, this entire model may not even fit your business. Um, but generally speaking, what those types of tests are, are logs tests, which basically means that, hey, if you are processing some requests as part of your system, um, maybe it's the request coming from users or other components of your system, then every system is going to like sort of spew out some logs, right? And that's going to basically tell you the ground truth, what happened when a request got processed. And I'm telling you that there is lots and lots of intelligence in these logs, depending on what gets logged, obviously. But you can leverage these logs and test the ground truth about your system. In other words, things like um, what we internally call as system invariants, how a system should behave if you look at the system as a black box complete, completely, can be something that you can apply into testing um, the logs of the system and make sure that it works. To give you an example again from ads world, um, we do keep a track of how many ads were shown on any given page, right? And we do have track, uh, track record of, hey, our users are telling us that, hey, I'm interested in sports, and I'm interested in hiking, and sort of some sort of health issues, and whatever it is. And we kind of keep track of that, and we try to target ads related to users' interest. So all of this information gets logged uh, into our logs, and we basically have lots of tests around logs. Privacy for us is really, really critical. In world of ads and other parts of Google as well, we do a lot for the users, and we keep a lot of the users that we know. We have a lot of user information. And we are stewards of data. In other words, we have to handle that information, both users' privacy as well as the data privacy, very, very seriously. Internally, we have lots and lots of privacy compliance uh, rules that we abide by, and that's what basically makes Google trustworthy for all of you as users of Google. So we have to also take into account privacy in our test sort of strategy. And that's definitely in the world of ads. And then all of this kind of testing is happening in development workflow, but that's not sufficient because as a feature developer, I can't just like write code for the feature, run all these fancy test frameworks that my Engprod team is uh, sort of building, and then assume that that feature is going to reach my users. No, there is a big step of releasing that feature into production, right? And that release step basically happens and should be 
sort of supplemented with what we call internally as canary testing. So canary testing meaning that during the release, let's try to expose that feature to make sure that the feature was not built only for audience in the US, for example, right? Especially if your product is global, such as Google, such as the ads business of Google. Now, from bottom to top, all of this kind of tests requires higher amount of setup cost. It requires tremendous amount of time and investment as you start developing like the stack of tests um, in this fashion. It requires higher number of machine resources as well. So you have to account for that. And by the way, it requires higher level of domain knowledge. So don't forget that. Um, now while doing this, you have to achieve a very fine balance and it's very hard. This picture, um, as you can see, I'm very, very inspired by my four and a half year old son. Um, and one day while I was thinking about GTAC and what I'm going to talk about, when he was playing with his cars, he kind of stacked them up. And I thought, yes, that's it. We need these four aspects about all of the tools and frameworks as engineering productivity engineers that we are to kind of deal with. A, our tools have to be extremely useful. We have to do something, right? There, there has to be a utility to all the tools and frameworks that you're building. B, our tools have to sustain. They have to be robust enough in edge cases, in extreme conditions. For example, um, if you are working in a database area, your tools cannot break because of con concurrency issues. C, you have to build the tools so that you are aiding the feature developers in their velocity, right? You are making their life smooth in terms of the feature development, the development experience, the releases, so on and so forth. So there is a velocity aspect there. And D, all of this kind of testing, basically quality has to come out of all of this testing only when you have quick and frequent and smooth releases. So there is a really fine balance that ne you need to achieve across these four dimensions for all the tools and frameworks that you are building. And that can be very challenging because all these four factors cannot work against each other. They have to work together. So now, with all of that, I just wanted to summarize what was our test strategy 1.0 in like the first like sort of era, 2005-2007. Um, we mostly kind of focused on um, before submit and after submit kind of defect ratios for some definition of defect. And by the way, we want it to be 99% defect free. Um, and most of our testing focus was still pretty much like few unit tests and system level kind of smoke tests and whatnot, right? But uh, what was happening with that was Yes, it was attractive to do it this way because we got done, like we, we basically solved the problem at hand. Um, we didn't have any dependencies because it was very quick iterations of those unit tests and smoke tests and whatnot. But there was hardly any sharing. There was hardly any concept of adaptability of our tools in relevant, applicable like sort of situations. In other words, we ended up with a lot and lot of like duplicated code uh, throughout this system. As I mentioned, Google was, um, the ads business at least, was kind of a hungry caterpillar where we wanted to just um, do lots and lots of feature development on a daily basis. And so our entire investment model was, hey, let's make sure that the features kind of get tested well. But who cares about, like, rather, we did not care, I should say. We did not care so much about whether those features were reaching our users on time or not and how smooth that release process was at, uh, at all. So there was a lot of problems with how we released at that time. In terms of our release strategy then for 1.0, what we ended up happening, uh, having was really, really long cycles of releases. We kind of released once or maybe twice a month um, at best. And a lot of those releases that we did because of the because of like sort of lack of any kind of advanced techniques of tests during development process, we had to rely on a lot of testing during releases as a result, just to make sure that things were working fine. And what that did was basically we tested in production most of the times. Again, this is something I want to spend a little bit of time because some of you may be of the uh, camp that thinks that why is it such a bad idea to test in production? Of course, it's attractive, right? Especially when um, your systems are becoming like have become so complicated that you just cannot replicate that setup in your test environment. You have to you have no other option but just to test in production. 
or when like there is constraints on you based on like machine resources or just the expertise of how to mimic your production workflows in testing you, there is no option but you have to test in production but think of this is generally very dangerous think of all the downsides that it can have in the world of ads for example what if i'm a feature developer who has a buggy code which was never tested with my unit and system level like smoke test but it was a bug that dealt with advertiser budget and i exhausted all the budget after i showed the ad like just few times and instead i charged the advertiser exorbitant amount of money or worse still if i am a developer who is dealing with some user data i did not i introduced some sort of bug that ended up deleting that user data without the user's consent and sort of knowledge right these are really horrible things that can happen if i just rely on testing in production and some of them are not kind of uh, they can they can be irreversible damages the biggest damage this can cause is getting ready to be sued your brand is affected so generally speaking testing in production is a very very bad idea and you have to change the mindset to invest a lot in testing upstream and that's what we started thinking about as we made the transition from 1.0 to 2.0 another thing i want to kind of just mention is uh, one of the heads of release engineering at google kind of was sharing a story with me and gave me this example and i really liked it so i thought i'll share it with you in terms of how the releases happened then was um, remember my town model <laughs> um so the business uh, when there was a small town kind of a thing uh, in small uh, town setting so imagine your releases for nothing but like bus service from point a to point b where those buses like think of releases as buses and those buses let's say carried whole bunch of passengers on them but the buses never left the station on time the the probability that the buses will arrive at the destination on time was very very low and often times the buses really encountered some problem or the else and they had to be called back in other words in reality the releases that we did were really long and buggy and we had to roll them back and we had to do more releases with bug fixes and patches and that was generally not a very happy situation and because of like infrequency in releases we often times sort of in the bus model allowed late arriving passengers because who knew when the next bus was going to go right and without really making sure whether that was safe the bus could take that load or not in other words we kind of entertained our feature developers to say hey by the way if you are going to do the release then can i can you please wait i'm just about to submit this change literally just give me 2 hours right and we just kind of entertained whole bunch of those things happening this was really bad <laughs> so um we had to change it and we changed it i'm very glad to say that uh enter 2.0 where we transitioned from the small town into the big city where we are right now i want to like sort of call this out as a period in google and in ads world of um, ads world between 2012 and 2016 pretty much some of the biggest changes that we did was our brand externally we are no longer called as test engineering we are called engineering productivity group we are an organization who has invested lot of time and resources and the talent that is now responsible for setting up systems that are uh, doing continuous testing that are deriving test coverage all the time and we as engineering productivity team are sort of focused on writing tools that augment these dedicated organizations uh, who are improving our releases or continuous deployment systems and test clusters and so on and so forth and we are also very very well aligned with our products individually in different parts of google but with all of this we have also made sure to kind of focus a lot on metrics which we completely lacked in the first generation in the first kind of era period that i mentioned and i'll talk a little bit about that um, later on now um i want to quote few numbers from my world of display ads um to kind of just give you a flavor of what kind of growth we are talking about here and what kind of evolution was happening on display ads side from infrastructure perspective i'm very proud to say that in this period we scaled the number of queries the ad requests that we receive in our stack 1000 times the number of developers who were developing code sort of grew by 10 times 
through hiring as, as well as acquisitions. And they were responsible, and they are, as of today, writing hundreds of millions of lines of code. That's the complexity we are dealing with. In terms of our revenue, we are responsible for a multi-billion business for Google, which was a phenomenal thousand times growth, again, um, since the beginning. Now, again, with respect to ads products, we are no longer are catering to users that are giving us those ad query requests from desktop. Our users have changed. Our, our users are move, uh, sort of moved to different platforms. So there is queries coming in from mobile phones and tablets and Xboxes while playing the games. We show ads everywhere. And we show good quality ads. <laughs> um, our feature set, in terms of what kind of ad formats we do, has grown from what was just contextually targeted ads, which was just text ads, to more interactive ads, which are really, really useful. And with all of this, we are taking into account the first party as well as third party user data. In other words, the data that user is directly sharing with us in terms of, hey, these are my interests. What we kind of ca categorize them as like uh, user interest verticals internally. And by the way, some information that we get as third party from third party websites, from publishers with which we do business, right? So we take into account all of this information and handle it in a privacy sensitive fashion. And by the way, while we were growing in terms of our business, engineering productivity function for display ads also grew multi, multi folds. What was an organization of like about 20 to 30 odd engineers is now an organization more than 200 engineers. We have grown in seniority and in our maturity of how we look at systems. And we are now tackling information across that pyramid, across different uh, axes of the test strategy that we plan for our ad products. The other thing that I want to mention is, uh, in terms of like evolution of test strategy that was happening, was essentially, as I mentioned, like going beyond unit tests and system tests to tackle different parts of testing. But also, we are moving fast. We are trying to be stable and achieve high, test, um, high amount of test coverage, more than 70% on an average, and releasing at a frequency of um, about 90% of our releases in a week's time. It is just phenomenal that we are aiding our developers with the speed at which they can go and do their development, along with keeping the system sane and stable. In the world of like uh, ads, again, the user trust, I want to spend a little bit of time there, user trust matters a lot, and we take that very, very seriously. Instead of saying that, hey, user data is too sensitive, I'm not going to touch it in my tests because yeah, I don't want to deal with user data, right? Uh, and just basically forget about disabling code paths. And uh, we, used to, we used to be in the model, I should say, uh, early on, where we said that user data is too sensitive. I don't want to be introducing it in my test systems. And therefore, what we ended up doing was turning off different code paths in production systems while they were under test, because those control paths really dealt with user data. But what ended up happening was, what was responsible for like a 5% revenue uh, through that control path now became responsible for more like 50% revenue because we wanted to target users with best possible ads and there had to be user data used for that reason, right? So in our test, we also started introducing concepts of user data in a privacy sensitive way and really invested a lot into writing test infrastructures, developing tools and frameworks where we could do a lot of analysis of, hey, is there, is there a data leakage happening between Google and all the external parties Google does business with? Internally, are we classifying the data according to what is considered as sort of privacy sensitive sort of data classification rules and so on and so forth? This is important because that's how we are earning users' trust. I'm very proud to say that Google is a partner in Network Advertising Alliance and both Digital Advertising um, Alliance as well. Google is a partner where Google does give users a lot of preference in terms of controls as well as gives, makes the user information transparent. So it matters even in tests that we kind of make sure that things are working fine. But with all of this, when we were growing so much and had to develop lots of different kinds of tools, what ended up happening was too much duplication. And 
Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on that topic as well, because some of you might be going through this as well. Now, we ended up having built, like we kind of built a lot of systems that achieved same goal at high level, but we used different mechanics to kind of get there. Generally speaking, duplication is bad. Again, this is one of the points where it can be considered as a con, but it can be leveraged to your benefit. Let's see how. Duplication is generally bad. Why? Because it results into code debt. You have a lot of like code that's doing exactly or sort of the same thing. And it also introduces different interfaces for the users of those tools, making it extremely hard. Cognitive adds a lot of cognitive load to your users who are feature developers, right? Who want to use your tools to kind of effectively verify that the software is working. So for those two reasons, you can think of this as something that should never happen. But on the other hand, Duplication is really good because it gives individual groups a lot of flexibility and ability to kind of provide customized solutions. There is no dependency then on one team that's responsible for a common tool to kind of cater to your feature requests. And you can just move really fast. So there is a debate between where, 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 where we, we can entertain duplication, where we shouldn't have duplication. And sometimes it's important to kind of know that this is a hard, sensitive topic. And sometimes senior management has to take, in, take some decisions which are very hard. And they can say that, hey, we are going to say we are going to stop use of this tool. Versus senior management can say that we are forging a merge of multiple tools that are doing the same thing. Now, this can lead to a lot of unhappy uh, feature, like sort of tool developers, as well as early adopters of those tools. But my point is that if the duplication is organized, it works really well. It can create a lot of competition, but it will also create collaboration so that multiple teams of good thought, like multiple teams can come together and <clears throat> produce best in class tools. But if it gets unnoticed, it will result into code debt and confusion. So something to kind of think about. Metrics and measurement. You cannot improve what you cannot measure. That's very clear. And we knew as we were evolving over time that um, there was no kind of visibility into how often we were releasing, how smooth we were releasing, what kind of test metrics were we were applying to developer workflow, so on and so forth, without really measuring all of those things. So we invested a lot into separate organizations and sometimes with help of engineering productivity engineers themselves to kind of gather a lot of data around these axes. Some of the kind of metrics that we are really interested in, for example, are um, let's say before you submit your change, how long is it taking you for your change to kind of run through required tests? How long is it taking you for your change to be available in production to your users? In when you actually submit that change, um, how often, and you're building those tests in a continuous fashion, et cetera, how green are those bills? How flaky are things uh, in production? Some sort of metrics around monitoring of what's happening in production. All of this matters a lot, and we have invested um, a lot into building mechanisms to make these metrics easily available to feature developers. One thing I want to mention here is it's not sufficient to just say that, hey, build a lot of metrics without really having executive sponsorship from your leaders who also believe in those metrics. Your leaders start believing the metrics, believing in, in such metrics, because it's really, really important that we can stack rank different projects on common footing when we can derive data for those projects through via these metrics. That makes it extremely easy then to kind of have a lot of different teams work with each other in a friction-free fashion. That's what the leaders want to achieve anyway. So we in ads in Google have had tremendous amount of support from our senior leadership to kind of set quarterly goals, yearly objectives to improve our, around some of the axes of either pre-submit or post-submit of change kind of like metrics that I talked about. And all of this actually helps because we also wanted to change the developer mindset of pushing testing to the last minute and instead doing a lot of testing upstream. So with these metrics, it was really, really easy for our developers to kind of know that, yes, fine, this is how long it's taking for me to kind of submit my change and get it ready, available in production, so on and so forth. 
Um, so I wanted to just sum summarize like how the entire process at Google in 2.0 is working out. This is kind of a 360 view of um, how we work today uh, in Google in my ad space. We have lots and lots of developer testing happening, which is the upstream part of it, and followed by a lot of continuous builds and continuous deployments that, uh, that run those tests in a continuous fashion and give us very early feedback whether things are working or not. We make intelligent decisions on uh, which change list, which kind of um, sort of change, uh, like sort of collection of changes is safe to pick to start your release process based on these continuous builds and um, test signals. We have lots of frequent releases. As I mentioned, over 90% of our releases are within a week, like on a weekly cycle uh, in world of ads. And it's not sufficient to do like just the feature level testing or the developer deployment, uh, like sort of developer workflow testing. We also do testing during releases, which is the canary testing, followed by lots and lots of production monitoring. Production monitoring, why? Because things can go really, really wrong <laughs> based on what kind of data was used during testing versus what we actually see from users. The traffic pattern changes completely over time as well, as a lot of you might know who are in the business of doing uh, sort of um, exporting features that are user facing. So we have put in a lot of automation. And along with that, we are also kind of reaping benefits of that automation because now our tests are more reliable, more repeatable, more maintainable, and there's less toil in terms of like uh, what tests are run and the records of it and blah, blah, blah. We have systems who, which kind of tell us that automatically. So with that, we are now looking forward to 2017 and challenges in future. We are at the doorstep of 2017, and some of the key things that, uh, key challenges that Google as an organization is going to have are going to be related to some of the things I've highlighted here, which is our brand. We are no longer an ads and search kind of company. We have so many different products going on, and there is a lot of integration between those products that's already happening or should happen. We are going to be heavily, heavily relying on um, abiding by the privacy principles of user data and user information that we have with Google in order to earn users' trust on a continual fashion. And we are going to have to sort of accept the challenge of working with next generation set of tools. With all of this, by the way, one thing to remember is machines do not come for free. So machine resources and cost should be taken into account while you're planning for your test strategy when you're dealing with all of the next uh, gen infrastructure. And that's one of the challenges too. What's our test strategy going to be moving forward? The model that we are going to apply is really focusing on deeper integrations. By that, I really mean that mo moving forward, we are going to have users who are sitting in their place and want to book a travel, want to do shopping with just their voice commands. Right? For that to happen, we have to have so many systems that need to work together, whether it's speech recognition, whether it's all the query analysis of the keywords extracted from user speech, and kind of connecting that to the payment system backend, so on and so forth, in order to kind of do the flight search in case of travel, itinerary planning, etc. There is a lot that needs to just talk to each other. Those are the deeper integrations I'm talking about. <clears throat> Google now is a um, 70,000 people organization, and engineering productivity function has also tremendously grown. It, is, it has grown not just in numbers, but also in our seniority. And the time has come where we have to start talking to each other and sort of achieve some sort of standardization and training across engineering productivity engineers across various parts of Google. So there is a challenge around that as well. How do we make multiple teams talk to each other and work in a friction-free fashion? And that's where the metrics are going to really help us. The other thing that uh, I want to mention is all the metrics and uh, sort of measurement that I spend a little bit of time talking about. Why it matters is because um, the, the data that like we, we basically have tons and tons of data now with our continuous build cycles and tests and releases and whatnot, but we have spent very little time to kind of really analyze that data. What metrics are working well? What metrics need attention moving forward? We have to start spending more time and do kind of analysis there. 
things like machine learning models and machine learning based sort of software is coming online more and more so moving forward. There is Google Home that's going to gather so many uh, sort of queries from users and we need to analyze even that data and make sense of it. That's going to be a new challenge for sure. And our users, when they use different kinds of platforms, they're no longer going to be just sticking around with desktops and mobile phones. They're going, there is going to be virtual reality out there very, very soon. We have to take that into, fact, uh, take, take that into account as well. Google as a company was really successful because we spent a lot of time scaling our server ar architecture. Our servers and distributed systems was backbone of Google from the get-go. But our ecosystem and our tools are not really best in class when it comes to uh, the new platforms, especially like mobile app infrastructure. And we realize that. We realize that as a challenge. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why this is a challenge and why it really matters. This slide is from OpenSignal that just gives you a little bit of idea of how diverse the fragmentation of all the Android devices there is as of like August of 2015. There is about 25,000 different Android devices that are out there. And for Google to make all of its products work in such a diverse environment, it's a very big challenge. Among different challenges, developing that mobile app infrastructure experience are how do we do testing correctly? How do we make the developer experience smooth from engineering productivity perspective, obviously? And how do we do monitoring in production? Especially for mobile apps, it matters how much is the application package size? What are the latency metrics looking like? What is the crash rate for that particular app? What is generally the memory used by the app? All of these metrics are extremely important for any mobile app. And for engineering productivity solutions in terms of like how do we test this? How do, how do developers really make sure that there is device labs, there is emulators, there is lots of unit tests? And by the way, all of this needs to work with the two major players, Android and iOS. So how do we even share those best practices and make it really, really smooth for our developers? Think of so many different common things that are out there that every single app needs to go through, whether it's account management, whether it's access management, the user identifiers, the data associated with the user identifiers and the users that needs to travel from app to app. If all of those things are not made as common utilities, common sort of infrastructure, which is non-flaky, we are going to fail big ways. So we cannot, and that's the big challenge too. And finally, the kind of, um, the kind of sort of uh, things that were working well before in Google, which are, hey, we have like ads area, and we have communications area, and we have apps area, and everybody has really well-defined sort of deeper integrations, which are product aligned, but in silos is no longer going to work. We have to come together. We have to share the best practices and build common platforms so that all of these different areas can provide the best possible mobile app infrastructure experience. I encourage all of you to attend tomorrow's keynote by Niranjan, who's going to go over some of the interesting artifacts of how that mobile app infrastructure experience is going to change for Google and what evolutionary and revolutionary things that we are already starting to do. So with that, I just want to leave you with a note that there is a lot to optimize. There is a lot that we can learn from the data that we are gathering. The challenges are enormous, but the typical model of build, test, release, and repeat is not going to be sufficient in what is going to come in future. I at least feel that we are very happy and well equipped to kind of take on these challenges. And we have started using machine learning algorithms, for example, to kind of optimize developer workflow to kind of decide some tests are completely useless and therefore they should not be run when the user is trying to submit their change and so on and so forth. So we have started doing a little bit in that area, but we could do a lot more. And that's going to be the next set of challenges. But I'm extremely, extremely excited for engineering productivity at Google, and especially in my area of ads as well, to kind of tackle these challenges. So thank you again. Thank you, the GTAC organizers, for giving me this chance and opportunity to kind of talk to all of you. And um, you were a great audience. So I'll be ready to take on questions. Thank you.
Is that a question, speech? All right. Thank you, Manasi. Excellent keynote. Uh, it's very scary to hear that we were testing in production, and I am so glad we are not doing that at all anymore. We're, we're not. Uh, so questions, would you like me to read the questions? Or I'll, uh, I'll read off the questions and you can answer them. Which tools or open source frameworks Google uses for automation? Well, Google is not one product. <laughs> Google is multiple products, and so this answer really depends on like what product space you are talking about. So I'm not like sort of sure like where where we kind of keep a long list of open source tools that we can use for automation or that we are using for automation today. Um, but I think there is some bit of that happening in our mobile sort of uh, SDK real related development. Um, so whoever asked this question, I would be glad to kind of get back to you with kind of gathering more information on it, but I don't have that list in my mind. OK. So please talk to me afterward. I think the lunch. basic uh, answer is lots of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so how do you automate testing a self-driving car? That's a good question. Something you do not want to do in production. <laughs> I agree with you. I would love to know more. I haven't explored that area as yet. So I certainly do not have the best answer here. Um, how do we automate testing of a self-driving car? But obviously, there is a lot of machinery that's involved in terms of uh, lots and lots of data that's getting processed to detect like sort of obstacles and whatnot. And I, I sure hope that there is a lot of tests out there. Um, I'm not f familiar myself directly. Okay. Very good. What is the percentage of automated tests versus manual tests? OK. So um, I, I, can, I can tell you for sure that, um, again, from display ads infrastructure perspective, I want to say um, probably close to 95% of our testing is automated. Um, there is a 5% testing that is manual. And things like um, we are now, like I, I don't know how many of you have followed the news, but um, Google has a new initiative to kind of produce products for kids. So make sure like there is YouTube available for kids and whatnot. And how that experience is going to change for a user when the user is considered a child versus the user is an adult, right? And for that kind of testing where there is like a lot of mobile experiences for kids or tablet experiences, et cetera, we do have some manual tests that I'm aware of. Um, but I want to say generally 95% is automated. That's Again, there are a few teams out there in Google outside of ads. Um, which are more front-end centric, and this answer may not apply uh, as 95%. It could be a little different, but again. Very good. Can you tell us a bit more about what sort of metrics are used heavily in Google? OK. Um, so generally speaking, I think I alluded to this a little bit during my presentation as well. Uh, but kind of metrics that we really care about are how long are developers spending time uh, in running those tests that we really want them to run before they can submit their change list into our versioning system. Um, in other words, are we really slowing them down at the cost of just saying like, hey, I don't want to do a lot of testing in releases, so why don't you take care of all the testing while you are doing feature development and just get frustrated with it? Um, so we obviously want to squeeze that time for developers how much time they are spending. Um, so we, we kind of typically refer to it as like a pre-submit latency um, for our developers when they're writing code. Uh, so that's certainly one very major area that we kind of um, dearly think about every single day. The other areas, other metrics are in terms of like uh, how many bugs 
uh, there are bugs, open bugs um, that are there in the bug repository. Um, what are we doing to kind of address them over time? How many of them are considered like priority zero bugs versus one and two and so on and so forth? Um, there is certainly a lot of emphasis given to how healthy our systems are in terms of how green those continuous builds and continuous deployment systems are, uh, because the greenness really matters. If your system, you are kind of writing tests which are flaky all the time and failing in production and whatnot uh, after you submit your change, your continuous systems are going to also be very red. Um, and therefore, that there is a possibility that you cannot even start your release if your continuous deployments are red. So we kind of focus a lot on like build greenness uh, in a continuous fashion as well. And there is a lot more, but I think we should get to more questions. Uh, yes, one <coughs> thing that I think is an interesting story about Google is that we like data so much we need people building dashboards to tell us which dashboards we should look at. Yes. We have that much by the data. way, <laughs> yes, I like that. And by the way, one more area which I kind of um, forgot to mention is uh, with with so much of this investment happening in engineering productivity to build those metrics very easily and make it available at fingertips and so on and so forth. There is also emphasis and a lot of interest that a lot of engineering productivity engineers have to detect uh, bad patterns in code and to detect dead code and bad build dependencies because in indirectly or like indirectly, this all amounts to the developer experience and developer velocity anyway. So we have very powerful techniques to kind of detect like sort of bad dependencies in our build system, um, as well as like uh, flakiness. Um, and yeah, we kind of uh, take that into account as well, like focus on it. <coughs> okay. Uh, and if anybody in the room had a yes. question, uh, be, feel free to raise your hand as well. I can get a microphone to you. Otherwise, I'll continue with the online questions. Uh, yes. from the University of Maryland. Um, so I, this kind of uh, related to both of your comments on uh, testing in production. So you talk about the bad things about testing in production. But now that we are getting into more and more learning-based software, it may actually be impossible for a developer or a tester to predict what the correct output will be at development time. So are we going to enter a period where we need to test in production? And how do we get around that, the problems there? Right. So again, um, as I mentioned even before, like uh, the model and the test pyramid, et cetera, it's kind of like works on an average, but not in every every single use case, right? So for things which kind of include like machine learning, where there is like supervised learning and whatnot, you obviously have to test in production kind of or like based on some data sets, but also on the actual user samples, right? In order to do the predictions and whatnot. So I think there is a mixture of like testing in production versus upfront te testing that needs to happen. But in terms of general behavior, and correctness for your software that's going to be responsible for user data analysis, that I would highly recommend or think uh, it, will, it will make sense to kind of test before it hits production. Very good. I think There's we have question. time. Uh, let me take one more here, and then I'll get to your. I think we have time for two more questions. How much time does the pre-submit phase take to qualify new features? Do you use test selection? So if I understand this question right, how much time does pre-submit phase take? Um, so typically, like again, I can give you an average answer. Um, it takes about 10 days or so um, between the time me as a feature developer has submitted my change list into versioning system and it is available in production. Um, it varies a lot depending on which, um, which part of the world in Google I am. Um, but uh, essentially, in display ads organization, uh, again, we kind of spend, um, I want to say, a good three to four days in like the pre-summit phase where it's not just about, uh, oh, sorry, uh, not three to four days in pre-summit, in about, in about like two to three days in pre-submit phase where um, the developer is actually running different tests or we are running the, running different kind of continuous tests on their behalf on their change list in parallel offline um, and kind of providing those signals. 
Hello, Rahul Gopinath from Oregon State University. So as an academic, I often find that software tests in open source tools are somewhat, some, sometimes wrong, outright wrong, or otherwise not sufficiently testing. So my question is, does Google actually verify that their tests are right? And do you have any automated means of doing that? How do you test your test? How do you test your test? Tough yes. one for the last question. OK. Um, so regarding the comment, the question was like, uh, some of the open source tools are poorly tested. And before Google really uses some of those tools in their sort of testing, does Google verify that uh, there are wrong tests? Sorry, is that correct? Yes. Some of the tests that are written are often outright wrong. And sometimes the assertions are not complete, or they, they don't really do anything. Like, are you sp specifically talking in terms of open source tools or in general? In general, open in general. source, yeah. OK, so um, some tests are outright wrong, and uh, yes, and whatnot, right? So yes, um, that's the very reason why we do not marry ourselves with 100% line coverage, meaning your test is done, like your testing is complete. Uh, because yes, tests could be wrong, and tests could be wrong because of the way the binary code is wrong and buggy. Uh, because if the test is written in a fashion that is too brittle, it's going to just like you know, do like sort of um, reflect ex exactly what the production code, uh, the binary code is uh, sort of do doing, which could have bugs in it. Um, how do we test the tests themselves? So um, we actually, um, I, I actually strongly think that um, there is no good point where we can say we are done with testing. Like the whole um, sort of, so again, engineering productivity, as an engineering productivity engineer, um, I'm going to do some sort of risk assessment of um, what is the risk associated with any particular launch uh, and sort of suggest the best possible test strategy and develop the frameworks that are enabling my future developers to write tests in. But I'm never going to be in a position and comfortable to say that if you have written tests here and there is certain amount of coverage associated with it, we are done and we are in good shape. Um, because things can like change very well in production in uh, ways you haven't even dreamt about. Um, the way we do testing of tests, we don't actually focus a lot on testing the tests themselves. Um, and therefore, we kind of actually exclude our test files when we do coverage calculations. Um, but how we, we kind of believe strongly in defense in depth. And therefore, we are not going to ever sort of just rely on 80% unit test coverage. Um, and calling that done. We are going to also do like system level test and some sort of, sort of log level test, which are testing the system invariants. And that way we are getting assurance from different ways that your software is behaving correctly. All right. Fantastic. Yes. Well, I think we're, we, uh, yes, I have, I have oh. Okay, oh. go ahead. So somebody also at Google thought about this issue, and we have something called mutation testing, where we deliberately change the code and then test, and then verify whether the test is correct or not. So we verify whether the test data and et cetera uh, is valid or not. So it's not used by many team here, teams here, but yeah, it's there. OK, thank you. Thanks for adding that. Very good. And we're out of time, but yes, thanks, Manasi. Sure. Excellent Thank you all. keynote. Let's give a hand. Give a round. Thank you. Of applause.